everybody. I'm Sarah Goldhagen. I write about cognition and human experience in the built environment. Uh, <clears throat> it's going to be a very different presentation from the other ones. I basically started working on, I'm really interested in aesthetics and the, in, the concrete definable impact of aesthetic decisions uh, in the built environment. So we, we know a lot about how we can, what kinds of aesthetic decisions promote social cohesion. And here the, the link to resiliency is really social resiliency. How do you create a community urban design that people want to be in and want to stay in? So this is by Jan Gale Architects. It's downtown Melbourne, the, sub, the central business district, which looked like the slide on your left about 25 years ago. Uh, completely dead after five o'clock at night, totally dead on the weekend. The central business district was a place nobody wanted to go. You're familiar with those kinds of places. Jan Gale Architects was hired to come in. And one of the points that I want to make here is that the design moves are very small. Uh, they basically took a very unpromising network of alleyways and what did he do? He sort of carved out some spaces so you could have these tiny little bake shops and cafes and so on. He repaved the ground. He put a little sidewalk in. It's not wide enough to really be a sidewalk, but it gives a sense of spatial articulation and differentiation, which is um, a powerful so that people know, oh, this is where I hang out, this is where I process, and so on and so forth. And I love the fairy lights <laughs> above. OK, so these are inexpensive, small design moves. And it's now, this is when I was there. That's my own photograph a couple of years ago of the most popular tourist destination in downtown Melbourne. Uh, OK, so and we have a lot of information on how to create social affordances in a way that people that will draw people in and keep them there. Um, <clears throat> how's the, where's the next? I'm sorry, next slide. Here we go. Thank you. I got it. Thanks. Now I have it. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so I think we know a lot about social. What we know a little less about is individual experience in built environments and where aesthetics come in. And so one of the things that I started to do, it's part of the whole Conscious Cities movement, is look at what we know about how people actually experience environments, how they wayfind, how they respond to textures, forms, materials, this kind of thing. Uh, and most of the people working in this field are working from a paradigmatic model of cognition called embodied cognition. Our cognition is shaped by the very fact that we live in bodies. Uh, face forward, back behind us, a little scary sometimes because we can't see it, and so on and so forth. And I'll just, I'm just giving you a few examples of how embodied cognition helps us to understand uh, more about what we should do to create socially resilient environments. Okay, one thing we know, how do people wayfind, um, find their way, navigate through space? Basically, they use two different systems. One is called an allocentric. That means outside the body. Uh, an allocentric system whereby, yes, you sort of flip yourself up and look as if you were um, a bird down at a map, gridded, whatever. You lay a grid across the space, and you say, OK, point A, the Empire State Building is here, and East Harlem is here, and that's how I'm going to go to my house. OK, there's also egocentric wayfinding is the system that you also need to use. And that comes from within the body. Uh, and you basically, the schemas by which we understand our own bodies and in space don't look a whole lot like small head, proportion maybe one to nine, and so on. don't look anything like what we look at when I look at you and you look at me in bodies. They look a lot more like those little guys on the right, 
uh, which are called homunculi. Uh, and basically what these homunculi are, the one on the left is a map of your sensory system, the one on your right is a map of your motor system. This is the amount of real, it's a topographical map of the amount of real estate in your brain allocated to each of these different sensory or motor modalities. So one of the things that you notice, so this is egocentric navigation. One of the first things that you notice, if you look at the homunculi, and there's actually literally a homunculus like draped on your sensory parietal cortex. You can see it with these huge tongue and, okay. What's the first thing you notice? Well, one of the first things you notice in these homunculi is the tongue, right? Gross. Okay, the other hands, huge hands. Why is that important? This time I found it. Okay, um, it's important because when we're navigating, when we're moving through space, we're actually imagining ourselves interacting tactilely with spaces, either imaginatively or actually like intending to go and touch. So one scientist calls this perception is perception for action, okay? Humans are unbelievably goal-oriented. We are always sort of developing schemes and then nested schemes within schemes. I want to look at that camera. So in order to do that, I have to walk over there up the, da, 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 okay? Um, so one of the things that this suggests, which is really interesting, is that textures and surfaces are a lot more important than we, than most designers really understand that they are. Some designers, sure, they get it. Uh, Another way to get at this is through, how many people know what mirror neurons are? Okay, a few. Okay, so mirror neurons are these cool neurons that were discovered about 15 years ago um, in macaque monkeys in which it was discovered that if one monkey looks at another monkey, I mean, I'm summarizing here just to make it quick and easy, um, and that the second monkey smiles the motor neurons in the first monkey's brain that are associated with smiling, fire, even though he's not smiling. I love giving that example because whenever I do, someone gives me a big smile, <laughs> which someone just did. Um, okay, so when that came out, I thought, wow, I mean, th that's like super cool, right? So. Is there some kind of analogy for inanimate objects? And it turns out that there is, for the perception of inanimate objects, it turns out there is. They're called canonical neurons, and they're not that far away from mirror neurons. And basically what it means is that as I look at that doorway out there, I mentally simulate walking out that doorway uh, or sitting in that chair. It's how I understand the chair. So sensory and motor perception are all bound up in one another. It's, they're not different. It's not the old model where you collect information from your sensory portals, from your five sensory portals, and then you process it, and you use your memories and so on, interpret it, and then you decide what you're going to do to act. Nope. Uh, it's all bound up in each other. Perception is perception for action. So what does this mean in a design thing? It means that walls like the one that you see on your right, this is uh, Allied Works at uh, the Denver Clifford Still Museum. Actually, you can't look at that without sort of imagining what it feels like to touch it. Or you can't look at a curved banister without sort of simulating what it's like to grab it as you walk up. Okay, so there are all sorts of aesthetic decisions that you can get from these things. Okay, now I show this project in honor of a dear friend. Um, what does this tell us about what we can do formally? Among the things that I think, and this is a hypothesis, this has not been studied experimentally, um, is that form is important. Form is certainly important perceptually 
this is a project in South Africa in a township. Uh, so most of the houses that people live in look like the one on the lower right. And this is a daycare center that became sort of a focal point for a little part of a community in this township. Um, built all out of recycled materials. And one of the things that the architect, whose name is Kevin Kimwell, decided was, you know, the form is not that important. Um, basically, he did a double pitch roof instead of using the single pitch roof of all of these township sh shacks. And he made it a little bigger. So he's not really innovative on form, not much. Um, <clears throat> Form is important for wayfinding, it's important for placemaking, it's important for imageability. Um, actually, I'm gonna go to this. Um, but where he did innovate was in the surfaces. Surfaces, textures, and materials. Again, all recycled materials. He spent two weeks driving around restaurants in Cape Town collecting wine bottles um, to make the bottle wall. And the, but. So, which has this wonderful light on the interior. And then on the right, he uses the same material from these pallets and basically just alternates between a flush board and then a projecting board. Flush, projecting, flush, projecting. Gives you lots of different opportunities to imagine, well, what what's it like if I run my hand down here? What's the cool of that glass feel like? What's the temperature of that glass? What kind of materiality is it? And so on and so forth. These are some of the ways that, that you can use small design elements to promote uh, mnemonic associations. So for example, you look at the bottle and you're amused because the bottle is now a wall, right? Um, <clears throat> and cognitive engagement and multi-sensory engagement in a project. We'll go back to this now. Another example, I show these two because both of them are very inexpensive. This is a church in Arkansas that was designed out of a three-car garage originally. It's a Ro uh, Russian Orthodox church. So there's the garage and that's what it looks like now. Um, <clears throat> again, not a whole lot of formal innovation. The innovation is elsewhere. Okay, another place, constructive process. Um, you, this makes sense according to part of what I'm already suggesting, which is if you show the construction details in an effective way, in a simple way, people will mentally simulate what it meant to put that thing together. So for example, in this project, uh, Kevin, is this pointer? Okay, I'm not gonna go there. Um, <clears throat> do you see the skateboards which he used as runners for the sliding panels? Okay, so you know what skateboards are like, they move. So this immediately suggests to you something that moves. And it's, again, it's sort of engaging you to interact with the building. People that interact either mentally by simulating or physically with buildings are gonna develop a, a more profound attachment to them and a, a more profound sense of place. And this, these are design elements. I just wanna stress that. <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, other constructive process, you see the way the window opens. Anyway, things are very clearly done. And this is, again, perception is perception for action. Okay, uh, this is a little more subtle, but I just had to show it because it's such a beautiful project. So in this Russian Orthodox church, they had very little money and they wanted a dome because that's an important part of uh, Russian Orthodox practice. And so someone, in the congregation finally donated an old satellite dish. And that's the dome. Um, so you don't really know that it's a satellite dish, so it's a little bit lost, but nonetheless, it's kind of this wonderful transposition of familiar and everyday into a different aesthetic context that has a really powerful impact. <clears throat> Color and natural light. Uh, Obviously, I mean, natural light, everybody loves natural light. We all know it's important. It helps promote circadian rhythm balances. 
Um, it helps promote an awareness of connection between the interior and the exterior, unlike in this room. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about natural light that I think is so powerful uh, it, as a design tool is how changeable it is. So this hallway and this hallway are the same hallway, but you can see they look very different at different times of day because, just because of the simple coat of paint and the way that the coat of paint interacts with different times of day and daylight. So there's a lot that can be done through natural light and through the interaction of natural light and color. Where's my mouse? Okay, now I need you again, I'm sorry. <laughs> you would think I would know how to use a mouse by now. But... Use yeah, this okay, well, that's what I'll do. All right, so if you, if you think, like, these are sort of design tools, but isn't taste personal? Um, how can you actually talk about specific design gestures? I point you to two studies, re both recent. Actually, the one on the, on the right, the awe, uh, is a, a bunch of different studies. I'm just citing one of them here. We know, for example, that when you feel awe uh, in an interior, that's the looking up, in the, in the nave of Chartres, in the transept actually of, not Chartres, I'm sorry, Amiens Cathedral, when you feel awe at a constructed interior that you look at, this encourages pro-social conduct, okay? Why? Because you have a sense of, a sort of a, a diminished sense of self, actually, and a larger sense of yourself as part of a larger community. Uh, another example, this is a study, I won't take the time to go into it, but uh, people were shown different images of nature and the hypothesis was that beautiful images of nature, like the, two on the up, like the two upper images, would promote different kinds of conduct than okay nature but not beautiful nature. And they varied them because the ones on the bottom don't have any species diversity. They're quite invariable. They're not very well manicured, et cetera, et cetera. They had analyzed all these different dimensions. Okay, so not only did they find that everybody agreed on which were the more beautiful images, that's one, but two, that exposure to the beautiful nature consistently promoted pro-social behavior. And they did this through experiments on measures of agreeableness, on empathy, generosity, and helping behaviors. So we shouldn't be afraid to talk about aesthetics, and we need to push the research on aesthetics in order to understand how better to promote well-being and social resiliency in our cities. Thank you. <laughs>